Okay? Well, go ahead and be opening your Bibles there, please, to the Gospel account of Mark. And I thought about where to start on this, because Mark is the shortest account of the life of Christ, and it kind of jumps right into activity. You know, Matthew starts with the uh, genealogy of Christ. Luke starts with John the baptizer. John starts all the way back in eternity. Well, Mark just starts right off with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and goes into the work of John the baptizer, the baptism of Christ, and then right into his ministry. So, there is an idea out there that a lot of people have that Mark was the first gospel written because it's the shortest. And as such, Matthew, Luke, Matthew and Luke came along later and basically borrowed from Mark and then added their own unique features. There are only about 50 verses in Mark that are unique to Mark. Each gospel has its own unique features features, own unique accounts, and things like this, but um, that issue that, and we talked about this a few years ago, we did a, we did a um, kind of a parallel study of Matthew, Mark, and Luke chronologically through the text. Uh, what this is called, and it's, uh, it's, it's the theory that, again, Mark wrote first, he's the shortest account, Matthew and Luke borrowed and then added their own, so it's called the synoptic Gospels. That's what Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called. John is never included in that because John is a totally different uh, piece of literature, you might say, in, in, along the lines of content and purpose. John comes right out and states his purpose in his account. Uh, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And so he tells us, and John only records seven miracles. So John's not included in what's called the synoptic theory. That you have these three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark's the earliest. Matthew and Luke borrowed off of him and then made their accounts longer. So just think about that for a minute. Do you see any problems with that? Exactly. Good question. Where does the inspiration of God come in? Uh, if they're just copying off of each other, well, anybody can do that, you know. And that's another interesting thing because Luke's account starts out with Luke acknowledging that many had taken it upon themselves to write an account of Jesus' life and all that he did. And he says, well, I'm going to do it because I have an accurate understanding of what happened. Well, Luke's writing by guidance of the Holy Spirit. So to take a position that just because Mark is shortest that he wrote first, that doesn't make any sense. Um, the length of the gospel accounts doesn't determine the date in which it was written. And then again to say that the other two wrote, uh, copied off of his writings, you're discounting the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No question about that. Yeah, the birth of Christ is not there. And Matthew and Luke. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. I've heard people say that the book of Mark was written specifically for the Romans. Yeah. Whereas Matthew's account was written for the Jews. And you take into account we're told that the salvation would be offered to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. I don't know if that has anything, would have anything to do with it, but. There is that idea out there that each gospel is written to a particular group of people like that. You know, we talked about Matthew last week. One of Matthew's main words is kingdom. And he talks about David a lot. Well, that's significant to a Jewish readership, isn't it? Whereas Mark, t talking about a gospel of action, <clears throat> you know, I'm a word guy. I like to study words. And so, uh, I don't know if this is a little neurotic or what, but I <laughs> went... I read through the Gospel of Mark on one occasion, and I counted the word and. And it's used a lot in every book of the Bible, but Mark in 16 chapters uses it 678 times. And and in the Greek language shows a continuous flow. And that's kind of the nature of Mark's narrative, that it's just a continual action throughout the life of Christ. Like I said, right from the beginning, that's how it starts. We jump to John, we jump to his baptism, two verses on the temptation and right into his ministry, 
his teaching and his, his healing. So there is some uh, validity to what you're saying, Tristan, about the different um, audiences of each gospel account. Yes. Anybody else have anything before we go any further here? Okay. Mark, as a person, is mentioned only eight times in your New Testament. I give you some information about him. We're not going to go through all of that, but uh, I give all of the passages where he's mentioned. He's a, and it's interesting the change that takes place with Mark in time, particularly as it relates to Paul. Um, you go to Acts chapter, the end of Acts chapter 15. And Barnabas wants to take Mark. Well, they're related. Paul doesn't. And so they part ways. The, the, the text tells us that the contention was so sharp between the two that they went their separate ways, but they both kept working. Um, why did Paul not want to take John Mark with him? He had left him at an earlier occasion, and that's recorded in um, Acts chapter 12. But then... Somebody turn over to 2 Timothy 4 and read verse 11. And this is towards the end of Paul's life. There was friction between... Friction, yeah. That's, that's one way to put it. Somebody read 2 Timothy 4 verse 11, please. Paul, he took his with me, take Mark, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Okay, so obviously things have changed with Mark between Mark and Paul. And uh, now he's profitable to me for the ministry. He's a fellow prisoner, a fellow worker. Peter refers to him as his son. Well, that would be kind of like Timothy with Paul. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. And it seems that that was the case also with Peter and Mark. So it's just interesting to note those connections throughout Scripture when they are there. Now, one of the things that's, that's I won't say unique about Mark, but it's, I guess you could say it's unique in a sense, the word scripture and the word law is only mentioned four times. There's not a great deal of, of Jesus quoting scripture. Mark does indicate a couple of times in his accounts that this or this was done so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Matthew and Luke are full of that. Um, so that again might show an indication that Mark's aim as a writer was not necessarily for a Jewish audience. That would matter to a Jewish person. All those reference to, references to the old law wouldn't necessarily matter to a Roman citizen, to a Gentile. But there are just a few of them uh, mentioned there. So, let's look at this. The book starts with a brief summary of the work of John the Baptizer. To me, you know, you, you can put Matthew, Luke, and particularly John. Really, the first three chapters of John gives us a greater insight into the work of John the Baptizer. Um, of course, Matthew and Luke give us quite a bit as well. And, you know, Luke, of course, records his birth. But anyway, uh, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Of course, this goes back to the psalmist. This goes back to Isaiah. And uh, Isaiah specifically chapter 40, the first three verses there. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. And, what do we often call John in regard to the work of Christ? What is his forerunner? I was thinking title, but that's not a great... Yeah, he's the forerunner of Christ. He kind of, as we might say, he blazed the trail for the preaching of Jesus. John's work and Jesus' work, they're, they're preaching the same message, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, we learn about John's baptism here. Somebody read Mark 1 and verse 4, please. Okay, a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You know, under the law of Moses, baptism was not required. Uh, but when John came on the scene, it was. It was part of his message. And so uh, it was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Something else we're told, and I cannot think of the passage off, off of the top of my head, but it says that, I think this is in Matthew's account, they all came out to John in the wilderness confessing their sins. Well, when we come to Christ, we don't come confessing our sins, do we? We come confessing our faith in Christ. So there are, there are some differences that we need to understand between the baptism of John and the baptism into the name of Christ. And that comes out particularly uh, 
in Acts chapter 19 when Paul goes to Ephesus. Uh, he found some disciples who had been baptized under John's baptism. And what had they never even heard of? Or who had they never even heard of? Yeah, we don't... Paul's question was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. So they had to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what happened there. And then after that, Paul uh, laid his hands on them and then they received the Holy Spirit. So uh, it's just interesting to note those things uh, here. You have this promise in verse 8, Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit baptism. Well, we see that in the New Testament on two occasions. Some would say three. But some, some consider Paul's uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit as kind of an off-scene, you might say, event that took place. But Acts chapter 2, the apostles are baptized in the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak with other tongues, and then what's the other account of Holy Spirit baptism in the New Testament? Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. They were given the gift of the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues, just like the Jews did on Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2. Is it, I'm going to repeat your question. Is it fair to say that John's teaching... Up to the cross, yeah. Up to the cross was transitional. I would say yes, because it's the it's it's the preparation mode for the kingdom. It's just a matter of you know Jesus' ministry, as we call it, lasted only for approximately three years, maybe a little more than that. And so transitional, yes, we're trend. And in fact, I tell you what, let's do this. Um, let's just go to Matthew chapter three real quick, since you. Mentioned that, Matthew chapter 3. Like I said, Mark just takes off, and we don't really get to see a whole lot. Somebody read Matthew 3. And we're talking about the transitional work of between John's mission and the establishment of the church. Matthew 3, 8 through 10, somebody please. That's kind of it right there. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. That old system of reliance upon your physical uh, descent through Abraham and ultimately through the Jewish nation, we're cutting that tree down and uh, it's going to be cast into the fire. And then, well, even right there in Matthew 3, what we just read in Mark chapter 1, um, I have baptized you with the baptism of repentance, but he who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, back to Mark. Any other questions or comments before... We proceed here. All right. So like I say, the book starts with a brief summary of the work of John the Baptizer and then gets right to the temptation. Matthew and Luke, what is it, Matthew 4, and I think it's also Luke 4, give us a 11 to 12 verse summarization of the 40 days that Christ spent in temptation. Mark gives us two verses. That was it. And then... And then John's in prison. Well, we read that in Matthew, what is it, Matthew chapters 11 and then 14. We read about those accounts. Uh, you've got then, well, look at Mark 1 here. Somebody read uh, 14 and 15 for us, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so it's interesting to note John's preaching this message, Jesus is preaching this message. John, or rather than Jesus, commissions the twelve to go out and preach the same message, and he gives them power over the demons and, and sicknesses and all these various things. And then we also have 70 others who are sent out two by two, and Luke 10 records that for us. So you've got 84 individuals 
during this period of time preaching the exact same thing all over this area. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, repent and believe the gospel as it says here in verse 15. So transitional I think is a great word to describe what was going on during that period of time. Come after me, verse 17, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Well, that was their, that was their business. That's, what, that's how they made a living. And now it's going to be transitioning into um, spiritual fishing, you might say. But then, So you've got that. And by the way, verses 9 through 11, we're only given three verses on the baptism of Christ here. Of course, that's when Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit, verse 10. And then you get down to uh, verse 21, and it starts immediately into the miracles of Christ. And that is when He began performing those miracles, is after He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. So, gets right into the temptation and the work of Christ. Um, and I put in here as well, Mark is a gospel of action. It is the gospel of action. Now, that's, obviously, that doesn't mean Mark and... Uh, rather, Matthew and Luke are not active Gospels, but Mark is just, it's like he's relentless in his record. You read all of Mark chapter 1, and the, uh, the beginning of the work of Christ here, and it's just like one act immediately after another, never, never slowing down. You've got verses 21 to 28, casting out unclean spirits, Peter's mother-in-law is healed. Uh, verses 32 to 34, there's a multitude of people who have gathered together. They are healed. Demons are cast out. Jesus cleanses a leper at the end of the chapter. So it's just, like I say, just uh, on and on. Mark uses a word 42 times. Uh, in the Greek, it's euthus. And, it mean, and it's translated at least three different ways in your King James Version. Immediately, straightway, or forthwith. So 42 times. In 16 chapters. Again, that just shows the continuity of the gospel. Or, or of the account here of the life of Christ. He records 18 specific miracles. What I mean by that is we're told the specifics of the event. Like here in chapter 1 verse 21 through verse 28. We're told all the specifics. The unclean spirit. It was a man. He was in a synagogue. All of this. But then you have three accounts in Mark's gospel such as in uh, verse 32, beginning, uh, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many demons. And I'll go ahead and tell you, if you're reading from a King James Version, you'll see this word devils. Um, there is a word for devil and there's a word for demon. And, and at the time when this was translated, they didn't, recognize the difference, but these are demons that are being cast out. Evil spirits. It's not the devil himself, so you need to know that. He refused to let them, or suffered them not to speak because they knew him. And that's an interesting thing, and this kind of comes out in all the Gospels, even in John's Gospel account. He didn't permit them to speak because they knew him. Somebody mentioned this last week. Who, what, um, what was the first miracle that Jesus ever performed? Turning the water into wine. It's, in record, it's recorded in John chapter 2. And Mary tells him that hey, we're at a feast and we're out of wine. And Jesus' response is, woman, my time is not yet. And we see that concept of his... his um, he recognizes that there's a, a period of time that he has to work. And so you have a, a phrase like this in Mark 1.34. He permitted them or suffered them not to speak... Because they knew him. And I think that plays right hand in hand with, it's not yet my time. And so, uh, and there are even times in the Gospels where he heals somebody and he says, go your way and tell no man. My time's not yet. But then Luke's Gospel does something interesting that Matthew, Mark, and John don't. When you get to Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, he knew that it was time. And, it, and Luke 9, 51 says, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew that was ultimately the end of his mission. And it's straightforward from there. So that's a unique feature of Luke's account. Anyway, 18 specific miracles and three, I put in there, many healed miracles. Mark records only four parables of Christ. Now, your other accounts, particularly Matthew, like we discussed last week, there's more than that in Matthew chapter 13 alone. And then 
The parables are scattered throughout the rest of Matthew's gospel. Luke records them. Jesus, uh, John records God, uh, parables in his gospel account. So Mark seems to focus more on the actions of Jesus than he does the teachings of Jesus. And that's not a problem. And, and that's one of the, the, one of the benefits of having four gospel accounts all being inspired by the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about inspiration for just a minute, okay? Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16. And I know you've heard this before. What does that word inspiration mean? God breathed. All Scripture has been breathed out by God. And you've got these men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You've got Paul and Peter and James and these different authors, eight authors of your New Testament. And specifically, like the four gospel accounts, they're all writing about the same life, the same individual, and many times the same events, but they're all unique. So one thing that we need to understand about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or God breathing this message out, they, what, so what does it mean if you were to have somebody write for you and you were dictating what they wrote? What does that mean? Writing by dictation, what does that mean? You write precisely what I tell you to write. I speak the word, you write the word. That's not how inspiration works. Being guided by the Holy Spirit is not like writing by dictation. And you see the unique features of, of each of these gospel writers in their book. They're all different. But that's because the human that was used in the process of inspiration and revelation was his own being. While the words are breathed out by God, they're not dictated by God. You understand what I'm saying? There's a difference between those two things. We need to, we need to understand that. And I think really the Gospels um, help us see that too. It's kind of like uh, one, one verse that I use a lot in regard to inspiration is 2 Samuel 23 two. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was in my tongue, David says. So that's kind of a good illustration, I think, of what I'm saying here. Anything else before we move on here? I think all of that plays into it. Just like the, um, the letters of the New Testament. They're, very, they're geared very specifically to precisely the audience intended. I mean, I'm doing Corinth right now in my uh, daily live stream. And that, that letter was... Uh, and Paul talks about this to great extent in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. was given by inspiration, but it was precisely to them and what they were dealing with. And uh, I think... Kind of getting off subject here. We're going to get to Mark chapter 2 here in just a minute. But something that I think you and I need to appreciate, that we need to understand, is that when we read these books, they had um, an original audience in mind. Uh, specific issues that they were dealing with. And again, particularly in the letters of the New Testament that Paul wrote and James wrote and all of this. Um... And in this process of what's called, again, inspiration and revelation, the Holy Spirit uses these men. But we need to understand that, because we do this a lot of times, we need to understand the Bible was not written to us. Do you know what I mean by what I'm saying there? It was not written to us. It's written for us, and we need to be able to study it from such a perspective as, to, to the best of our ability, and I'll never forget, Curtis Cates always, Brother Cates always used to say, Read this with your first century glasses on when we're studying through the New Testament. Put your first century glasses on. Sit where they sat. As if you're the church that's receiving this letter from Paul, that's the way you understand the Bible. So many people look at the Bible and they'll say something like, well, what does that mean to you? And I think that's the wrong perspective. Now, there's stuff certainly we can pull out of the text and stuff that applies to us. But if it means... If it means one thing to me and one thing to you and one thing to somebody else, then it means nothing at all. It doesn't mean anything then until I put my meaning into it. And that's just not the case at all. 
Right. Yeah. And <laughs> when you think about that, God chose to use human language to communicate to humans. And those people, when they received those letters, they knew precisely what was meant, which tells me that I can know precisely what was meant. That doesn't mean there aren't some difficult things, but we need to do our very best to, to have that, as we say, first century perspective on the content of, this, of these books. Yeah. I mean, we were the believers. Well, then why have... Somebody wrote it, and they just copied it. Yeah. That's what you'd think. You know, right. To see what it looked like. Yeah. This is just a human element, especially historically considering all the information you show. Yeah. It is, and, and that's the some position that people take, is that there was a kind of a collaboration between these authors, and then over the centuries there's been edits and changes and all that kind of stuff, and... That totally discredits, totally undermines the biblical doctrine of inspiration. To say that one would write and these other guys would copy and then they would get together and edit and piece it all together. Uh, that totally takes away from inspiration. Anybody else before I move on here? All right, let's go to Mark chapter 2. There's, there's a passage here that I want us to deal with and we... We actually talked about this a bit in our young adults class Sunday morning. One of, in my opinion, one of the most important passages in the gospel accounts that speaks to the uh, divine nature of Christ. And this is the occasion where <coughs> Jesus was in a house and there's a man who is uh, sick of the palsy, Mark 2 and verse 3, he can't get through the door. So what do his friends do? Take him up on the roof, they lower him down, and the text says that when Jesus saw their faith, notice that, um, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, why would he say that? They weren't lowering him down for Jesus to forgive his sins. They were lowering him down because he was sick of the palsy, as it says, to be healed. Here's why he's, I think this here is why he said this. There were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? That's true, isn't it? No man can forgive sins. Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why, ye, why reason ye these things in your hearts? And then he asked them a question. Which one's easier? Is it easier for me to say, um, thy sins be forgiven, or take up your bed and walk? Which one's easier to do? You're going to rank that? That's his point. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, because that was the pronouncement back in verse 5, son, thy sins be forgiven thee, so that I can prove to you, you'll know that I can do that, forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. And what? What's the second word in verse 11? 12. Immediately. That should have shown forever to those scribes, Oh, this isn't just some guy. This isn't some man or just some prophet. This is the Son of God. And they again, you think of their willful blindness here because they admit... Who can forgive sins but God only? Verse 7. They wouldn't say which one's easier. But to prove that he could forgive sins, he healed the man. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all. Insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. So that, I tell you, Mark 2, verses 1 through 12, is extremely important, I think, in understanding the divine nature of Christ. And also under what we were talking about in uh, our Sunday morning adult, uh, young adults class was like evangelism, talking to your friends and family. And one of, the, you know, one of the things that people will throw out is, well, what about the thief on the cross? He was never baptized. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether he was baptized or whether he wasn't baptized. Jesus on earth had the power to forgive sins. If he, could say, if he wanted to say that to somebody, he could say that to somebody. And so when he said, 
today thou shalt be with me in paradise, guess what? He was, because he could do that. Because he could also say, arise, take up thy bed, and go to thy house. And that's what happened. So, I think that's a key passage in helping us understand the divine nature of Christ. Jesus was not just a prophet. Um, you know, Islam holds that Jesus was a good man, he was a good teacher and a prophet, but he was not the son of God. This text, among many others, uh, proves quite otherwise. Anything else before? Would this be considered a miracle that here's where he's healed him, but it's the part about just looking at the scribes or whatever and saying, knowing what they're yeah. Well, the, Mark says it both ways. Mark in verse 6 says they were reasoning in their hearts. And then he says in verse 8, he knew they were reasoning in their hearts and then he just brought it out. So absolutely, that speaks, that as well speaks to his divine nature. Um, it's kind of like 1 Corinthians 2 talks about uh, in regard to inspiration. The spirit knows the mind of God. Yes, the deep things of God. Well, you have complete unity between all three members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They know each other, but they also know us. Uh, it's kind of like Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are naked and open under the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. So, anybody else before we move on here? That's a good point. And a lot of times people say the reason why he wasn't healed is because they didn't have enough faith. Well, yep. It doesn't matter, does it? Ms. Sharon's pointing out that um, Jesus didn't see the, the man with the palsy's faith. He saw his friend's faith. And that is a, that is a claim that uh, quote-unquote faith healers use today. When you're not healed, well, you don't have enough faith. The power to heal people was not in their personal faith. What their faith did was cause them to go to the right place to be healed. The power was in Christ. And again, I'll reference Acts 10.38. That's what that verse is talking about. The power is not within the individual's faith to be healed. But if they didn't have the faith to go to the right one, or they doubted his power, well, then there's a problem. But the power was in Christ himself. All right, let's go to Mark 16 real quick. Got just a couple minutes left. I thought I would address this briefly. So Mark 16, verse 9. Most every version of your Bible, various English versions. Now I've got up here with me a little, this is a, just a New Testament in Psalms. So it doesn't have any marginal readings or any cross references. It's just straightforward text. So it doesn't have this. But every other one does. Typically. So there's a footnote in my Bible that says this at Mark 16, 9. Verses 9 through 20 are bracketed as not in the original text. They are lacking in Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Those, are, those two codexes, those two uh, manuscripts, let's use that word, they are, fifth, they are documents that were discovered in the 5th century of the New Testament. Well, those two... Uh, codices did not include Mark 16, 9 through 20. I can't remember which one. There's one of the two, though, that after the, the Greek text stops in verse 8, there's a section left blank that's actually the perfect size for what would be verses 9 through 20. Now, it, the, the footnote here goes on to say, although nearly all other manuscripts of Mark contain them. The original Gospels and the original New Testament was written in the Greek language, but it didn't stay in the Greek language. You have a variety of languages into which it was translated over time throughout the centuries. And I don't know the exact number, but basically you can say accurately the rest of them contain verses 9 through 20. Do any of you have a note like that in your Bible that says something along those lines? Well, some, most do, some don't. But... Um, you will see passages like that occasionally where there will be a footnote. I'll tell you another one is Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. 
Um, another one's found in 1 John chapter 5, verses, about verses 6 through 8. Particularly, I think it's verse 7. But there, the, the process of translating from one language to another and using a variety of ancient texts, there are what's called textual variants. It doesn't mean that there's problems with inspiration. It just means perhaps this... And, and here's another thing. Those other two that I was talking about, they're missing... One of them was missing the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation. So you have to watch that kind of stuff when you see those footnotes. It's good that if you see those things, you might have a little bit of information about, well, what does that mean? Does verses, do verses 9 through 20 not belong in here? Well, they absolutely belong in here because nearly every other manuscript that's ever been used contain those verses. It's just those two that don't. Some of your versions um, are... <laughs> And I, I suppose the worst one is the New International Version. Um, the best, I'll just be honest with you, the best thing you can do with that is lay it on its side and use it as a bookend for the rest of your books to hold them up straight. Uh, it'll say things throughout its text that say, most reliable manuscripts do this or don't do this without acknowledging, well, what does that mean? What do you mean, most reliable manuscripts? That's a... It's just a terrible version of the Bible. I'll just say it. Uh, and there are some others that are pretty close to it. But So anyway, there are a lot of folks who question the authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20. And you will see footnotes like that. Um, but you need to know that there is another side to that story. That it, that's not just, well, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, they didn't include it. Well, there's space there for it. And there are other texts of the New Testament that they don't include. Like I said, the book of Hebrews, the book of Revelation, things like this. And yet there's no footnote made about that. Kind of interesting. So, I don't know, I thought I'd talk about that for just a minute. But, uh, you know, we did, I don't remember how long ago it was, but we went through like eight weeks of study on the canon of Scripture. And we talked about this kind of stuff. The variety of manuscripts, the, the various languages. And uh, it's beneficial to know some of that kind of stuff. All right, any questions or comments on any of this? All right. Well, we'll do Luke next week. Luke, longest gospel account, 24 chapters, 1,151 verses. So you got seven days to get that done. <laughs>